Hello, everybody. My name is Philip Marek, and I'm presenting a short talk detailing the grants for companies proof of concept, which is already a few years old, but you might be interested in a few details anyway. As we already heard in the morning, uh, we have a portal for companies in Austria, the Unternehmens Service Portal which is used for many, many activities uh, where companies need to pass on data, accept data and stuff like that. Grants for companies is embedded in this portal. It takes data from public registers and then filters a list of grants depending on which of these grants may be applicable to the company in question. The big improvement is there are about 6,000 grants in Austria, 3,500 for companies and the rest for individuals. So if we can drop 90% of them because the company is in the wrong country of Austria, in the wrong city or whatever else, we can reduce the work for the company by a tremendous amount because they have quite uh, a few grants to sort through to find out which are even meaningful for them. This is a purely functional rule evaluation. It has no side effects by definition. This also allows us quite a few optimizations. I will come to that later on. Um, yeah, the next line is out of date because the study that is referenced here was published last week. I'm sorry about that. If anybody is interested in it, uh, I can send the link to the study. No, it's not published by the university yet. Um, I can try to find a link to it and ship it around in ELSConf. The basic result is that symbolic AI is allowed in public administration but anything that is non-reproducible is not, as we heard in the morning already. Yeah, we are not using any generational AI. So this is purely a kind of office automation, if you like to say so, because in my opinion, it's not uh, the definition of AI as the European Union has decided it, or not yet decided it, um, doesn't apply to this code because the code itself cannot take any decisions by itself. It's purely rule driven and by outside data. The interesting use case, which we will talk very shortly about as well, is not the rule evaluation, but the reasoning over a lot of rules to find out which are the same rules, which are nearly the same and stuff like that. One of the really interesting questions when designing a new language is what do you put in it? What do you leave out? And what the most people are talking about the syntax. Here you can see a few design considerations. We wanted it to be very concise. So XML tags were out of the question. Uh, we wanted it to be easy to be passed by machines, easy to be read by humans, and it should also be easy, and this is one of the major points, to compare it to the original text, which might be a law or some other legally binding uh, text so that a lawyer can try to compare them and say, yes, this means the same because somebody has to take over responsibility as soon as this becomes more widespread. Also, it should be unambiguous. So precedence rules are bad. Um, in case anyone's interested, that small QR code goes to a YouTube video where Uncle Bob talks about how every C programmer has Kernighan and Ritchie in his uh, bookstore 
and knows on which page the preference rules are because nobody remembers them. So we don't want that either. And of course, we want it to be future proof because we know something that is halfway successful should live at least 10 or 20 years or even longer. And we do not want to redesign it every few years. What is the logical conclusion of this? We use S expressions. I'm not sure why, but one reviewer of our paper accused me of using my personal preferences for language design. I can't imagine why. Here we see the text of a genuine uh, grant. Most of that stuff isn't really interesting. That what's necessary to get uh, a rule-based evaluation is this part here. And if you translate it to S expressions, it looks like this. I come to the difference between German and English words right afterwards. Uh, if I switch back for a moment, you can see that three points here correspond to this OR clause, which, uh, where each clause has a few uh, requirements in itself. And if we optimize that a bit by extracting common parts, we end up with this here, which looks quite nice and readable, in my opinion. If you imagine having XML tags around that, uh, it would become much more noisy. If you imagine leaving out the parentheses, you have the problem, do you use uh, space characters or tabular characters and all that stuff again? So I think that's quite a nice way to display the grant code. Also, you can see that we can embed comments with the same syntax as in common lisp. When designing the grant language, we talked quite some time about using German words, English words, or a combination of them. And we settled on a combination because all the stuff that comes from law texts or other legal documents, like Rechtsform in, which is the legal form of a company. All these specific terms from German, we kept as is. But the general operators and or and not, we use the English words. It's a bit unusual to read. I'm not sure, maybe somebody uh, knows programming uh, Microsoft Access 1.1, where you could use German words for a German locale and stuff like that. That was horrible to read. And I was reminded of that. But actually, if you have only German words, including und instead of and, it's very hard for a programmer to read because it's unexpected. We also support a kind of package, like in Common Lisp, that makes it easy to have a few basic terms in one package, in an API package, that uh, return data coming from a register, and all the other concepts that get stuck upon that can be put into different packages for example, gv.at for the government related stuff. That's a derivation of smaller facts. We also have a few interesting things like there is Klein und Mittelunternehmen being used in many grants, which means small and medium sized companies. But actually, there are three different definitions of Klein und Mittelunternehmen. Sometimes not even the company or the part of the government who gives out the grant knows exactly which one of these is meant. 
and of course they are all different. So we use the same key, we use the same function name, ist KMU, for is Klein- und Mittelunternehmen, but have different prefixes, different packages to differentiate whose definition that is. In our grant definitions, we use one file system directory per agency, and also we generate one package per directory that allows to have an agency define its own concepts. We have quite a lot uh, of these where some city, for example, says our general requirements are these dot point, 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 point. And then the grants just reference these general uh, requirements and perhaps add one or two other clauses. Using one directory per agency and one directory per one package per directory allows us to extract these out. So if they ever need changing, it's just one definition that we change and not a whole number of uh, grants. Also, by having this package concept in, it allows us to do incompatible API upgrades or downgrades. By having a grant specifying a different package, the grant should be read in. Anyone remembers CL21? No. Okay. We also allow to do numeric calculations in there. The reason is that quite a few things change over time. For example, tax limits uh, get changed every few years. And by not having the values hard coded in there, but showing how they get calculated allows for more transparency for a direct comparison with the text from where the definitions are derived from. Also, this is uh, an interesting point. We expect that these limits change over time. So it's also expected that we will have a more or less big case structure asking for which year the evaluation should happen. Because if I want to know what was last year applicable, I need to specify, look up the limit for last year. So. A simple example, this is how it looks like. You can see that quite a few of the clauses we can only have here as comments because the data is either not available in a register or it cannot even be in a register. For example, there are grants uh, that give out money if you have some innovative solution for a problem, but this evaluation engine cannot decide whether it is an innovation or not that has to be done manually by a human. We also see here a small detail. Uh, there's a difference between having a location somewhere or having the main location somewhere. That also makes quite a difference. This is how it gets displayed in the proof of concept. You can see that the comments uh, are visible. The code is in a small column. And on the right side, you can see the result of evaluating this one clause. And it gets accumulated up to the tree root. Please don't be alarmed. This is a real world example from the pandemic. The code looks like this. I don't want to discuss it in detail. But you can imagine for someone to have to look through all of these clauses to decide is that something I should pursue or not is a lot of work. If we can drop the work for 50% of the companies, it's already a win for all of them. As soon as the grants are in a way, uh, are digitized in a way that allows for comparing them and 
analyzing them with a computer, we can do meta-analysis over them. For this, the proof of concept has a bit of code in it to convert the S expressions we saw earlier into prolog code. This can be either exported as a text file for offline analysis or directly passed on to Squire Prolog, which is attached to the process via pipes, standard in, standard out. And then you get an interactive form in HTML where you can insert Prolog queries and have them evaluated. There's a bit of uh, syntax highlighting and stuff like that also. This is one of the examples. I know that the boxes and the coloring don't look that great at a first glance, but the important point is you can click on them and compress them down to a single button or expand them again to make it easier to read. In this example here, we see we ask for a grant and for another grant, which must be different, where one grant clause includes all the other grants clauses. So if one company uh, is applicable to one of the grants, the other one applies automatically. So there's a kind of overlap between the grants. And if we look at it, any company that is that has its location in Kempton uh, will be applicable. No, the other way around. Sorry. Any company that is in Kempton and has these clauses fulfilled will also fulfill this grant here because it has fewer clauses. So we can see which grants are duplicates or overlap and stuff like that, which is important information for the Ministry of Finance to find out can we reduce uh, the number of grants. That was the main content. I believe there's still some yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. I believe it's better if I take questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you're correct. Up to now, these grants have been entered manually. We also have uh, the problem that as of right now, there's no lawyer or nobody of the uh, people responsible for the grant looking over the code that we produce and saying, yes, this is correct, this is what we meant. So this is one of the reasons why it's information only right now. Um, we thought about having a way to apply for a grant if it applies to my company with a single button press. But for this, uh, we need to have more assurance that the code is what it should be. But this, that is quite hard. Uh, sometimes it's not clear which kind of definition for small and medium-sized companies is being used in the grant text alone and other small details. Yeah, you said that there are some clauses that cannot be formalized, right? The company has the right to and so on. So why don't you put some uh, special form that will output this information to the user that okay, all these requirements are satisfied and there are additional requirements that you cannot check and uh, uh, just notify about it? Because yeah, as I understood, understood uh, once uh, some company receives this information, they can uh, assume that they are eligible and then Maybe there's some other clause that they don't satisfy. And this is not that. And another question was maybe a little bit related about using of uh, variables in this uh, forms. You said that uh, there are constraints related to tax as well. Let's say that there are 
uh, as a standard minimum wage or something like this, like uh, or some other variables which are regulated by the law on uh, year by year basis or something like this. Is it possible to put them into this? Uh, the question is. Um, the question was whether it's possible to show more formulated queries to the user and ask for information instead of showing just a comment. And yes, this is something that we already do in the proof of concept, but we don't have it in production yet because it raises quite a lot of questions. For example, quite a few grants ask for are there any disabled persons in the company? But a disabled person would be personal data and either we don't store it and have to ask the company every time or if we store it, it's personal data and we have quite a lot more work to store it anywhere. So that's where we run into limitations uh, where the company data gets more related to personal data and there it gets complicated. Did it? That was a similar question, so I'm fine. Okay. Okay, maybe one more? Yeah. Uh, you said that you don't use any generative AI, but what if you would use generative AI to generate your corpus from legal text, that would be feasible? The question is whether we can generate the legal clauses from text, uh, and the answer is we, not, not we as Federal Computing Center, but the Ministry of Finance started a project last year to get automated translation, but it isn't quite that easy. Quite a lot of the grant text have lots of and and or accumulated in one paragraph, and even as a human, it's not clear how they get uh, associated with each other and does this part belong to this or not and stuff like that it's really hard to digitize thank you thank you thank you